All right, everyone. Um, welcome to the discussion today. Um, I'm actually pretty sick today, so luckily uh, I'm going to be handing off most of this conversation to our uh, new contributor to the uh, DeFi Insider show podcast. Um, that's uh, Netrum. He's going to be kind of running the show today. So um, with that, uh, we're also joined by <clears throat> North and uh, Dog from Ramses. And Ramses is a DeFi protocol that builds on the principles of Solidly. Uh, they foster a community-centric and highly decentralized, efficient platform. And uh, Ramses is operating on Arbitrum at the moment. And uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. I'm going to go lie down. <laughs> Thank you. Only for the intro, Feel better. Thanks for the intro. Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Doug. Thanks, Nod, for having here. Uh, let's start with the audience. We They're still coming, but let's, let's start easy and simple. Let's talk about what Rams is. All right. Um... GM, everybody. Um, Ramsey's is one way you could describe Ramsey's as a liquidity bootstrapping protocol. Um, the longer answer is it's built from what was originally going back almost a couple years now, um, the solidly innovation that Andre Cronje brought to market uh, starting on Phantom, which essentially was a way to uh, more efficiently, a more efficient DEX um, by separating out the trading fees um, away from LPs and um, giving those to uh, you know VENFP voters um, that are aligned with the protocol, and then rewarding the LPs on the LP side with um, native token emissions. In our case, uh, RAM and that has a, a number of different, you know, interesting uh, dynamics that play out um, different than a traditional deck. Um, but that's the kind of the short of it. And um, most recently, I think one of the more um, compelling and kind of interesting uh, variables that we've just introduced is Ramsey CL, which is uh, taking um, the kind of technical superiority of concentrated liquidity um, from Uniswap v3 and then attaching to that um, our bribe uh, infrastructure and we can go deeper into that but really interesting dynamic um, early stages seeing that how that plays out um, in essentially a competitive farming scenario which um, as LPs compete to provide uh, the tightest and most efficient uh, bands um, to where the trading is going to take place uh, so that they can, in the only way that they can earn fees, um, it sets off this, uh, this competition that is unlike what we've seen before and we're really excited about what, um, what that could mean. We could talk more about that. Anything you'd add, Doc? Um... I think you you hit the nail on the head. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're better at explaining it than I am. I would just say that, you know, hopping off what North said that the contrary liquidity. I think the biggest thing is that you know there, there's contrary liquidity all around. I think there's multiple pro, uh, protocols doing it. Um. The rewarder and where exactly, you know, how we're able to distribute the rewards is actually where it's done differently. So a lot of people do not know this, but for example, um, you know, one of the biggest contra liquidity providers that isn't Uniswap is Algebra. And they have kind of their own built-in farms and stuff that you can use, but there's kind of some like mathematical flaws that are built into it that in typical dev fashion, they're not bugs, they're features. So they became part of the core features. Um, 
So we, we didn't want to include any of these like mathematical flaws or bugs. So what we did is we essentially just took Unity V3, which you know, was battle tested. There's no bugs in it. Um, and we actually just kind of built off of it. So our actual pools in Unity V3 as a whole, like our actual core, um, we modified the code. It's mainly the same logic as far as like the swaps and like the pools and all that, but it communicates effortlessly, effortlessly, ah, effortlessly with our gauges. So like the boosts are kind of caked into the actual pool. Um, so, you know, the ABIs are a little different, things like that. I guess I can go on forever, but long story short, we, I believe we took something that was missing uh, in the market with, you know, mathematically sound farming built into, you know, constant liquidity. And, you know, we, we paired that with the V3 model. Okay, thanks. Let's, uh, let's go back a step here. Uh, tell us why, why Ramses? That's my first why. But my second why is why arbitrary? So what's behind Ramses? Yeah. Um, why why a Egyptian theme? What's the history there? Okay, so the actual theme and stuff like that is 100% North. North came up with the name. I think the Egyptian theme we just kind of like we really liked it. I forget what the exact reason was, but we were kind of going like, oh, we should do like an Egyptian type theme. And North kind of like came into Discord and post this like. 5,000 word like d dissertation on why we should be Ramses and he has all these pictures and like crazy explanation and then we're all just like yeah like that's great <clears throat> let's go with that um, but I can let him speak more on why no it, it was the dissertation that was the whole thing uh, no it, it um you know it's a rich area like it's just this time of prosperity right um one of the first superpowers and um what was the bread basket of the world at the time you know with the nile and and um kind of geopolitically there where they were positioned um away from enemies and different things um they had to cross the desert to get to them and so we you know and it's a rich space that's fun um and kind of speaks to this you know, kind of the fair, the idea of a pharaoh and and um, and prosperity and things like that. So that's kind of what set us off uh, down that path. And I think you know why um, the protocol itself. You know, we both shared a little bit about that, but we were as a team, we were all kind of bonded in this furnace <laughs> of challenges <laughs> going back a couple of years, where um, you know things with the solidly v1 on phantom just you know got wrecked and it was a really tough situation for a lot of people ourselves included but we really wanted to see the experiment and the innovation play out and so that just kept us really tight to it kept us deep into every inch of the mechanism trying to sort it out um you know dog played a big role over the last you know year plus of you know together with others finding vulnerabilities figuring out how to patch them you know improving the system and ultimately you fast forward we wanted a shot to do it the way that we want to you know run a protocol and run a project in the kind of community that we want to have fun with and build with and that leads us to arbitrum which you know was just from the very beginning just to us the most DeFi centric l2 and i think that's that was a lot of the drive obviously there's also a lot of momentum coming out with the um the airdrop and and then just some of the interactions with other protocols we just felt like that was where we we wanted to be Just, just a quick um, question on that. Um, so uh, DeFi-centric L2, uh, that makes sense. Um, 
Um, I, I guess I would be curious, like, what your thoughts are on uh, optimism, and did you guys like ponder that quite, like a, a lot? And then, in um, sort of as a follow up, uh, did you guys consider going on uh, other chains like uh, Avalanche, Solana, so on? And uh, how did you sort of make the decision between other chains versus versus an, an L2? Yeah, so I mean, I can speak to that. Essentially, you know, I think we chose Arbitrum mainly because the actual you know experience of using Arbitrum is crazy. I think the first time anyone ever uses Arbitrum, they're kind of shocked at how quickly you know, the finality and all the block times are. Um, I wouldn't get into all like the technical details of why it's like that, but essentially, you know, all these other chains at the time. Uh, I think one of the biggest things is we just wanted something that was like. You know, very fluid, very smooth, and Arbitrum really fit that that narrative. Where you know, I've every time I've used Arbitrum, I'm like, wow, like this is super nice, and I've never had like issues with the actual, you know, transactions going through and things like that. And it's relatively cheap. So, you know, we come from if you if you come from like mainnet, you know, like transactions. I remember vividly doing like one multi sig transaction would be like three hundred dollars for like a batch transaction. And then we come to Arbitrum and it's like 60 cents. So it's like ju just that alone is like, wow. You know, you keep, you retain the security of like the mainnet layer. Um, I think which is, you know, one of the most important things is maintaining the integrity and, um, you know, security of the actual platform. So Arbitrum and Optimism, you know, are the two biggest layer two, uh, you know, roll ups for Ethereum. And, and I think we, we honestly didn't look into going to other chains i think we were really just dead set on arbitrum because it was missing like there wasn't really any you know b33 like exchange that existed on Arbitrum at the time that you know i think was was worth like pursuing so you know we saw a, a need a market need and we you know saw the opportunity show up so we decided hey, let's go to arbitrum whereas you know optimism Belgium's already there and you know they're friends of ours and we didn't, it didn't really seem like there was a reason to, to compete with them. Whereas, you know, why why not bring this sort of innovation to Arbitrum where it's really needed versus going to like a saturated market. But unfortunately, as we came here, I think like 15 others came here and it just kind of like, I don't know, saturated us worse than we thought. But I think it's fine as far as people really saw like the benefit of the model. I think it's, you know, imitation is uh, the best sort of flattery. Yeah, and I'd say maybe th in addition to, you know, um, Villadrome really setting up a nice, um, you, you know, uh, you know, having a nice setup on optimism and really having things cranking there. Then you, you look at B&B, &B, which is just a different beast. It wasn't really within our, you know, kind of our interest set. And we also had, you know, Dr. Liquid and team, you know, once you get there and really off to the races with with Dina. and so then you look at you know base well base you know there's a much longer story there but it's of course early and then uh zk sync you know um even that well well there's a lot of things that are attractive about that also for our timing and how we're thinking about things and wanting to come into you know existing you know liquidity depth and so forth and some maturity um that didn't match you know where zk sync was at the time or or even quite yet at this point although growing fast um so that kind of combined with just our initial you know attraction and and what we'd experience you know individually interacting on arbitrum um plus the DeFi, you know tone to everything we'd experienced that made it a really easy choice Makes sense. Um, I, I think uh, next, uh, next one's going to want to move to concentrated liquidity. But uh, before we do, since we're still on, on the um, Arbitrum um, section of this discussion, just curious, um, can you tell us a little bit how you view like the um, the competitive landscape uh, in terms of DEXs uh, on Arbitrum? So like the uni model versus, but not necessarily like the model, but like more like the market share and, and um, how things are sort of playing out and um, between, you know, Uniswap and, and Liquidity Book um, and Camelot and, and so on, and maybe a little bit how you see that evolving. I think, honestly, it's like the saying where it's like, you know, it all returns this weird scenario where this town is big enough for all of us, 
Like there is so much volume and, and you know, liquidity here and, and interactions and the chains are just starting to grow. I think, you know, we, we're at the very beginning of, of its true like exponential growth. Um, people are already just starting to notice like Arbitrum is, is really off to the races. And, you know, I think there's plenty of space for multiple DEXs and all that. But as far as a competition goes, um, you know, we ultimately, yes, they're all DEXs. And we, we are all DEXs, but we all approach it from a different angle. So everyone's going to kind of, you know, as far as participating in the actual protocol, people have their own preferences and what they you know, want to deal with. So I think ultimately there's not much overlap with that. I don't think there's too much like our users versus people who are using other DEXs. I don't think there's too much of like a, like they're not comparing it too much. Whereas I think when it comes to like actual legitimate swapping and aggregating, that's where like the real overlap is with all these DEXs. It's because everyone's fighting for the same market share on swaps. Um, so ultimately, you know, that always comes down to, you know, who has the most efficient and lowest slippage swaps and, you know, fees taking account to that, but ultimately slippage is the most important thing. Um, so, you know, that's why we went to cost your liquid um, Maybe who owns the all you know, on every chain they're on. Uh, and, you know, for, for good reason. I mean, cost of liquidity is, is so much more efficient than the traditional you know, Uni V2 model or even like a stable swap, uh, you know, curve that we're used to. So we decided, hey, like, why, why go with, you know, some other, I guess, rendition of it? Because a lot of these other cost of liquidity models were simply just made because Uniswap was under a, a you know, business license. Like, you, you really could not fork it and, you know, not be kind of infringing on their intellectual property. Um, and so we, once, you know, April 1st came around and, and that Bizzle license was, was kind of gone, uh, we saw the opportunity and we decided, hey, like, let's take this, you know, battle tested already, I guess, you know, the, the math and logic within UAV3 is so insanely good. I think people overlook how, you know, how brilliant and advanced Uniswap themselves are. Like the team is just so crazy good that, you know, why, why even try to think you can build something better than them as far as like the math and logic goes. So we decided, hey, let's take something that's already battle tested and great. Let's try and make it fit our model and, and try to uh, improve on it where we can. So UniV3 is the most gas efficient um, out of all the cost of liquidity models. And, you know, I think that itself is already, you know, means a lot, especially when there's a high, high volume of trades and stuff. And a lot of people view they're comparing right now in the bear market as far as contra liquidity providers go but what they don't realize is gas efficiency is going to be the most important thing when the bull market comes around and gas prices are multiple times what they are now because then it gets accentuated and you know those who have lower gas costs are going to be routed more often and that's why we thought more long term rather than oh like maybe this other one has like something that's slightly better as far as entering the bear market, but does it really scale? No, they don't scale. Um, and none of them have actually been tried in the bull market, whereas Unib3 has actually gone through the bull market, um, survived through the bear as well. It, it really is just fundamentally the best that's out there. Um, ultimately, I don't think anyone holds water to it. I, I don't think there's really any other partial liquidity provider that, that does it as well as them, even though there are you know, different uh, uh, you know, I guess innovations that have come to cost of liquidity. Ultimately, it's you know, people. Sometimes in, in in life, it's not necessarily the most innovative that you know will work. It's, it's more so what is the most trustworthy, what is the most battle tested, what are people comfortable using. I think everyone's comfortable using Uniswap. So I mean, even on top of that, we use their permit model. So if you if you approved our to like a token to Uniswaps. Um, you know, if you've used Unity 3 and you've approved token there, you can actually use that on our decks. So we inherit that. So if you're approved, you approve to Uniswap uh, and their V3 on Arbitrum when you when you go to use our decks. So you're actually not giving any sort of like approval to any sketchy contracts or things like that. So if you trust Uniswap, you should trust approving uh, your token to us. Essentially, it's the same thing uh, when you use the permit model. Um, so we want to inherit a lot of their like security and innate battle tested models. Um, but, you know, I, I always just ramble on about this stuff. But once again, long story short, uh, I don't think anyone holds water Uni V3, and I don't think anyone will anytime soon. Thanks, Zuck. 
Um, JF, you wanted to another question. We move to concentrated liquidity. I think Doug just uh, well did a, a really nice intro. I would say for all of uh, those that are listening to us, we are talking with Ramses. Ramses is a Dex on Arbitrum, and we are going to be touching a few things about them. JF. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the next, yeah, the, your your next question was sort of answered, right? Like explanation of uh, yeah. concentrated, what concentrated liquidity. Um, so, I, I mean, I was curious after that to know, um, and maybe you've already answered it, uh, but uh, how do you see the Uni V3, the concentrated liquidity model? Like, do you see that evolving at all, or do you sort of think we've, we've like reached uh, sort of like peak uh, optimal form? Uh, and you know, yeah, I don't mean to be redundant. Maybe you sort of meant that already, but maybe you can confirm. No, it'll get better. I mean, I think there's a, a V4 right around the corner. I mean, V3 is literally years old by now, which I think people are just now like, oh, Contra 3 is so great. It's like, they've done this for years. Like, it's been out for years. I think people are just starting to pick up on it. Um, and they're way ahead of the curve. Like, the V4 will come, I guarantee it. And whether it's, you know, V3.5 or a V4, um, there are a lot of things that can be added to like, kind of like view it as like you v1 to v2 i think that's what v3 to v4 is going to be like it's not going to be something substantially different as far as the actual like underlying way way the model works but i think there's gonna be a lot of improvements and kind of like making it more adaptable to different things because ultimately uniswap they they've always kind of been a i guess a, a public good and a lot of people fork their stuff like that's sim simply the fact that they're you know so so commonly forked and used it's like they're they're essentially a public good i think their whatever their next iteration is is going to be a very improved form of like the order book because ultimately contra liquidity is is just mimicking a, a centralized exchange order book and that's like the most efficient thing that you can think of and mimicking that on chain is, is what unity 3 accomplished um, and being able to make that more efficient is, is essentially all i can see happening for the near future uh, I don't think, I never think that it's, we, we've hit kind of like a terminal velocity. I feel like there's always more that can be built and there always will be more things coming. But I think, you know, if, if we are looking for what's going to be the next big thing, I think just look at Uniswap and see what they do. Cause I think they're pretty close to releasing some new stuff as well. And, um, if I understood correctly, you're, um, you're mixing the, the solidly model with uh, this concentrated liquidity model um, and just curious uh, I know there's been like a lot of different solidly forks on different chains um, is, is this typical of other solidly forks or is this something that differentiates Ramsey's only the the full range of cost of liquidity involved so um, I think Athena was the first to actually bring a, a sort of cost of liquidity um, but they kind of uh, they made it very user friendly by by wrapping it into using gamma and algebra and kind of you know offloading a lot of the uh, complexities to a third party. Whereas we did everything in house, so we're not limited to any sort of ALM provider or any sort of um, we have the zero limitation. So everything is done in house, um, and you know the actual cost of liquidity is forked and Uniswap and modified, but everything else is completely unique and in house. Uh, our gauge, so our actually the part, the part that has this integrated with the solidly model is completely we license that because there's so many you know solidly forks around and we really did not want to just kind of hand out some some hard effort immediately. So we we licensed it. So anyone who does take that, obviously like they, they can, and if they did, they'd be discredited um, because it, it really was not something simple to accomplish. Um, you know, the dev and, and manpower that was put into it was pretty substantial. And uh, I think, honestly, it's, no one is going to be able to do it anytime soon properly because it is not something that is easy at all. And, and on actual, like, to make it work, especially with boosts and stuff, because we, we try to retain as much as possible from the original Solidly. Because ultimately, the original Solidly was immutable. It didn't work out because there were some bugs found um, and a lot of other drama, things like that. Um, and then every model after that, none of them actually kept the original model and no one knows, no one ever saw it, if the actual original saw the model would work or not. And so we were like, hey, why wouldn't we just try and, you know, keep the original model as close as possible while keeping it modern? Um, so, you know, with the boosts, I think we're 
the only, like one of the only um, V33 DEXs that actually retain the boost, which, I mean, speaking to Andre himself, he even mentioned that, you know, the boost is, is absolutely fundamental to the entire model. So when, you know, the creator of something is, says it's absolutely fundamental, why would we try and kind of you know, get rid of it? And I think it works very well with Curve and things like that. Because um, the way I like to put it is solidly essentially was they took, Andre took Curve um, a lot from Curve and he just translated it from Viper to Solidity. Um, and then on top of that, he mixed it in with the V33 model of, or I mean, just 33 model of, of Olympus and rebases while wrapping it all into a, a transferable uh, NFT. And I think that that's like the biggest difference between, you know, the solving model and like what Curve and other DEXs have done. Uh, now we're taking it to the next step with the conscious liquidity, um, with this, you know, this, we like to call it competitive farming because the tighter your range is, uh, the higher your emissions and fees. So in regular Unity V3, the tighter your emissions, the higher your fees, but there's no, you know, emissions and things like that. So you pair with the 3-3 model and gauges, you can direct emissions towards it from voting. Um, and then those who are, you know, fighting for the lowest, providing the lowest slippage to swappers and, you know, the highest efficiency, they get rewarded the most. And ultimately that's where I think, you know, we're, we're doing it in my opinion, the best as far as any V33 is simply because um, whereas relying on an ALM to choose a predefined range, um, we promote people to even do like a one tick range if they want to, and they'll earn higher rewards. Um, there's obviously more risk in that, but you we're giving people the full opportunity to build their positions however they want. We're not limiting them to any sort of third party provider, things like that. So we want it to be fully flexible. Uh, and future proof. I think there's no reason to pigeonhole ourselves into some some current model that we think works right now, but we'd rather be able to adapt and, and you know be be modular to anything. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> one way that helps to look at it, because it is <clears throat> quite a complex system, is to look at it from the different, you know, participants and what their benefits are. So if we start with uh, a partner um, who is trying to you know, build liquidity. Let's take Frax as an example. So Frax um, wants uh, to deepen liquidity um, on Frax. And so they um, choose a, you know, 0.3% uh, fee tier um, for concentrate for Ramsey CL. And then they, um, bribe, they incentivize um, that particular fee tier. <clears throat> so then um, from their perspective, um, the, the epoch runs, um, they are able to, um, uh, they are voters themselves, and they're able to capture back, uh, you know, a significant portion of that um, incentive that they placed, and then they recycle that um, for the next week, right? Or the next epoch. And that's really unique. Um, it's especially, you know, pertinent for protocols that are trying to um, start from nothing. And it big protocol uh, established like Frax um, wins out um, in comparison with some of the other, um, you could call it marketing, you know, initiatives to deepen liquidity. Um, that they are, you know, spending, you know, treasury resources or, you know, or budget on. And so they continue to go, you know, bigger with it. So from a, a partner standpoint, our protocol is trying to deepen liquidity. Um, that's this benefit is that they have this, they've turned, we've turned an expense into um, an investment. Um, then if you move to the uh, VRAM voters, um, they can come in and say, okay, Fraxy has incentivized, uh, they put 5,000, you know, um, on this uh, 0.3, you know, percent tier uh, for Fraxy on Ramsey CL. Um, I'm going to vote for that. And now that voter, um, wherever along the, um, you know, the band, like any, any trades that take place, they're getting the lion share of those trading fees and they're getting their portion of that incentive, um, that bribe that's been placed there. Um, and they're getting a rebase on their voter position. And 
Um, so for, for them, they're able to participate in the uh, benefits of a superior, you know, technology, you know, with concentrated liquidity, um, which at the end of the day just equals, you know, um, more efficiency at, and in their case, a higher, you know, APR than where else they could be, you know, um, spending their time and their resources. And then you go to the LPs and for the LPs, they um, can come in and say, I want to supply for, um, you know, Frax ETH, um, and I'm going to now collect um, these RAM emissions that are being driven by the voters, and I'm also going to get a portion of these trading fees, um, and I can win big because if I can provide um, the tightest, you know, uh, band, I'm going to be able to, you know, beat the other LPs that I'm competing against. Um, to take home, you know, more of those uh, fees uh, than they are. Uh, so if you have these, these, and then of course, on top of that is just traders, you know, and low slippage and all the aggregators, you know, being able to, and the whole system benefiting from all of this competition and this, uh, this trifecta of interactivity. But that's, that's how one way you can look at it is you have the protocols that are deepening liquidity and incentivizing. You have the voters, the V RAM holders, um, voting on certain pools and collecting all this, um, all the rewards. And then you have the LPs who um, have an opportunity um, based on how it's set up to um, really produce some, some significant APRs. So, um... In my day job, uh, I, I work for More Money Finance. Uh, we're a stablecoin on the Avalanche chain, um, and uh, currently we have put. Um, so you, you can trade between uh, money in USDC and money in AVAX on uh, two different dexes. So we're on um, Platypus, which is uh, essentially like a single-sided ver- uh, liquidity version of, of Curve, uh, and we are on the um, Trader Joe liquidity book, uh, and. Uh, we are still incentivizing uh, through bribes uh, on Platypus, um, but when we recently, so this is a very recent pool on uh, Trader Joe, when we re- recently launched, uh, we made decisions not to in- the decision not to incentivize, um, and to see if the concentrated liquidity model there could be like powerful enough, where as a protocol we don't have to like give crazy emissions, um, where we're like debasing our own participants, the people who own our token, um, and and have uh, enough liquidity that's just generated by, by trading fees. Um, so it's like a very early test for us. Uh, but but I do think that like it, it seems that the space in general is heading uh, in this direction where uh, hopefully in the future we find a way to, to have um, DEXs be so efficient uh, that uh, the, the liquidity can be paid for by just trading itself. Um, do you like what I'm talking about here in terms of efficiency? Uh, how does that fit with the solidly model in general? Um, yeah, how, how would the interaction uh, there uh, sort of work out, and, and how do you see that evolving? Like on your expenditures, how do you think about if we if we framed it as a marketing expense? How do you think about? Uh, those incentives that you're spending from that standpoint? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would still, I, I think when you're like launching something, uh, it makes sense to spend on marketing. Uh, but if it's like an ongoing expense that is going to uh, go on for the life of the project, um, I don't know, I, I think it's like over the long run unsustainable. I, and I, I think as an industry, uh, we're, we're trying to find a way to just not naturally, like, um, you know, efficiency wins, right? So like naturally the industry is trying to find a way to get a DEX that is, uh, so efficient that, uh, these emissions don't have to happen because emissions hurt the, I hesitate to use the word shareholder, but the, you know, the token holders for the project, right? Uh, so, you know, if we're, we're thinking about crypto as a, as a sustainable, usable, useful uh, ecosystem um, and not up only like gambling. Um, I think we have to find a way to, to solve this problem. Sure. And, and so when you and and currently you're in a bootstrapping phase, right? Um, and 
and so when you spend X, you know, um, how do you think it, what's, what's the return on that investment for you? TVL? Um, I mean, I think there's like different metrics, right? Like, so it depends what we're trying to achieve at that uh, point in time. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the clear use case for protocols that are using Ramsey's is they want to build TVL. And so for them, it's okay. If I, um, what is a sustainable, um, uh, incentive, uh, structure I can set up, um, to where I'm able to, um, place an incentive and then through voting power recapture on the weekly that incentive and just recycle it right back through and the whole point being on the other end what i'm getting is increased tvl <clears throat> which has all the benefits that i need you know for utility and for my project that's the key difference i think when you think about sustainability um that in a sense is the is the promise and in some ways already the fulfillment with the v33 approach is that the native token takes on the um the inflation, um, in our case, RAM, um, so that the uh, fraxes and the liquidities and the XCAD, you know, all the, um, the protocols that are looking to build TVL, they don't experience that um, inflationary, you know, negative of their tokens that they do on a traditional, um, you know, in, in a traditional DEX. But some of the math, what has to, what you have to do is you have to build, you have to invest, right? So you have to build your position over time so that you are able to um, capture um, your incentives on the weekly, recycle them, and just watch that TVL, and then be able to crunch the numbers and say, you know what, on a dollar uh, invested basis, um, I'm getting the most efficient, you know, TVL growth. Um, from Ramsey's um, it, that compared to anywhere else in DeFi. And that desire and that math, mathing out and partners who figured that out, if you watch them, how they behave is they grow their positions over time and, and they make sure not to get diluted. And that in and of itself is what takes, then if you come back to the RAM token, which is not their primary interest, but it, it, it is an interest. The value there is that um, there is buy pressure um, as um, increasingly people want um, and see the value of holding um, strong voting positions, right, uh, to drive emissions um, and recapture bribes um, and or, you know, if you're just a voter to be able to get APRs um, by holding RAM. And so you buy it, you lock it, and you maintain your position over time, um, which, you know, through the rebases, through just the, the system performing. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, this is uh, let's let's say it like this. This is the the issue we have seen historically since the Unity two times when Sushi uh, did the fork. Basically, uh, this new Dex pays that volume by emitting, and we have seen that this is uh, or this creates just on itself a really downward spiral for the Dex. So that's why I think yeah, that was Andres. You're trying to speak. Yeah, you're not listening. You're not hearing me. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello. yeah. Hey, I, uh, I hear you great, Netro. Yes, Wait, ah, okay. Oh, okay, Doug, that's, that's <laughs> your issue. My God. Okay. So I was saying, uh, so these taxes, they, they get diluted, they get a downward spiral. And we have seen this with the UniV2 model because there have been a lot of them. And, and then we saw the UniV3, that's the, the Uniswap protocol with the ticks and the concentrated liquidity. And, and that's great. But Uni has a, let's say, misalignment between LP participants and token holders. Right now, remember, Uniswap V3 doesn't have, uh, doesn't stream any kind of revenue uh, to the Uni token. So I think that's one of the 
let's say, one of the biggest improvements, one of the biggest incentive alignment I have seen on the solidly model is the way that you can align those kind of incentive. You, you have your native token, which is an emission token. So naturally it will depreciate over time. But on the other side, you generate uh, incentives that go towards not selling that emission. And that's what I'm seeing with with Ramses and some other uh, B33 models that we have seen. But um, I think uh, we are good on that. I think everyone is understanding that part. So let's move to our next set of questions regarding decentralization. How is Ramses thinking decentralization right now? I know you, uh, Ramses is right now uh, upgradable. It's not immutable. We learned this on the original Solid Leon Phantom, immutable bugs on the system, a lot of uh, issues there. So I understand the initial push for having upgradable contracts. So what are you guys thinking for the future? Yeah, I can I can speak to that. So, our initially, yeah, as as we're we're growing, we wanted to keep kind of the upgradable contracts because I mean we've had to do actually a ton of upgrades um, since we've started, and it's whether just to fix little minor things or make add extra read functions to make it more adaptable for partners to, to you know integrate easier things like that. Um, ultimately, it's it's just. Uh, you know, the original Saldi, there were so many bugs and issues that you know, just could not have been fixed. And that was the ultimate problem that I think even Andre himself acknowledged was it, he shouldn't have made it completely immutable from the very beginning. Even though that's what we all strive to do, but when you're really kind of pushing the boundaries and innovating, you don't want to like rashly go out there without it being battle tested at first. So I think the biggest thing now is, is ensuring everything's battle tested before you kind of just give up the keys to the castle to the burn address and say, hey, like, we're decentralized, it's great. It's like, well, do you really want to put your users at risk? Do you value decentralization over being able to ensure that user funds are safe and that they're actually having a good experience? And I think there, there's that balance. So currently, yes, we are upgradable, um, but we do use a time lock. We do have methods to mitigate any sort of risk on us so people don't really have to fully trust us. and. You know, if they don't trust us, they, they'll get a notification before we make any upgrade and they can, you know, look through it. They have ample time to see what we're actually upgrading will be changed. Um, and we try to, you know, let people know. But ultimately, uh, yes, like the plan is to essentially kind of go towards this like curve model of an uh, emergency council. So all like the kind of partners we have that uh, will be kind of representatives for their own community. And they would be the ultimate decision deciders of, okay, like here's a proposed upgrade to the contracts. Um, our team has no actual ability to execute it by ourselves. We would need this emergency council to actually approve all these things. Um, and they would actually be the signers themselves. So uh, nothing would essentially go through without being checked and, and notified by everyone uh, and, and their respective partners, because essentially we're protocol for protocols. So our, our user base is these protocols. And as a result, their users are kind of um, ends up being our users so we want to cater to them and you know we want to make sure they're always comfortable with, with us, what's being changed and being modular and upgradable um, will allow us to do that so we, we will keep the proxies but as far as us having control but we won't have control in the future it'll be completely a you know emergency council which you can view it as like a, a representative system you know these people if you're a um, I don't know like a, a frax user Frax, like the Frax team themselves, will be one of the signers in the emergency council. They'll be actually able to, you know, make that decision. Like, hey, do is this upgrade necessary? Do we approve this? Yes or no? Um, and essentially decentralizing it through a representative standpoint, rather than, you know, have like tens of thousands of people being the ultimate decider if something gets upgraded. I think, you know, we we want to be this total fully decentralized model and just the space in general. But we all know DAOs don't work. Um, they're not proper yet. You can't make actual like 
there's, there's some changes in models that cannot be done uh, fully decentralized. Like there, there's certain, it's just limitations we have currently with the state of how the EVM and everything is. Um, it doesn't mean that later on it won't be able to be fully trustless and decentralized. Um, but currently, if you really want to be able to, you know, provide the to the needs of, of all your I'd rather it's constituents and people who are using your platform, uh, you have to, you know, be very like flexible and able to change things. And I think that's what an upgradable uh, model does. Um, but decentralizing that upgradable model is where you reach this kind of perfect medium, in my opinion, where, you know, no one has to rely on the team. Uh, but, you know, you rely on like 30 other projects that are involved in the actual platform. So you don't necessarily have to trust Ramsey's, but if you trust Frax, if you trust Liquidity, if you trust, you know, these other projects, then yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you don't trust them, uh, or if you don't trust like the majority of all these other partner protocols, then, you know, ultimately there's, I think there's a fundamental uh, problem in the space as far as, you know, we never did a good enough job of, of displaying kind of the trustworthiness of people. Um, as much as we want to be a fully like oh people don't have to be involved like we're human beings people are always involved in every aspect of our lives um even in a future decentralized model people are going to be involved trust will always exist <clears throat> it's not about completely getting rid of the trust it's about mitigating that trust to the bare minimum and making it verifiable that any changes that are going to be made are, are not being done in bad faith so i think we we strongly like i personally strongly believe in decentralization but I believe decentralization doesn't necessarily mean that there's zero human involvement and, and, and decision making um, in that regard. Like I feel like there completely has to be human intervention and, and reason for people to to provide their input and, and common discourse and things like that. Um, you know, we the the biggest I think the biggest benefit of being a distributed model is the different viewpoints and cultures and things that everyone else like, kind of colliding together and trying to find this this ideal. Um, you know, debated medium that everyone can agree on. And so as long as, you know, there's technical limitations to being able to fully decentralize a model, um, I think we, you know, the idea is to just mitigate the amount of, of responsibility and trust required uh, to fully operate something in a quote-unquote decentralized manner. Yeah, that's, that's a very fair assumption, I think, yeah, that decentralization and trustlessness trustlessness i think i i didn't mangle that word uh it it works on a scale so you you keep working towards an objective uh, and i think it, it's uh, it's very reasonable what you what you're saying doc so we 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 try to keep these things uh on the hour we still have nine minutes but the idea is to also open up to the audience if anyone has questions for 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 dog or for north regarding Ramses. Uh, meanwhile, while we wait, people just raise your hand, request uh, to speak, and I will give it to you. No problem. Meanwhile, that I I wanted to touch base just on. Well, I pronounce it, and sorry if I mangle the word. Enead, because it's the the let's say the the, the old tale. But I understand that that's not actually the English uh, pronunciation for the protocol. But I have no idea how to say it. Sounds yeah. good so, to me. Yeah, uh, you, you understand it, North. I know you do. Iniad, Iniad. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Sorry, Aki, if you are listening. But I, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the composability behind uh, Ramses. How are you guys working with the the NAD, the NAD crew, the the boosting that you were mentioning at the beginning, Doug? Yeah, yeah. So I think that was one of the major things. Like we kept the boost, um, and that that's inherited from Curve. I mean, Curve has you know convex. So essentially, NAD you can view that as our convex layer. Um, I think another good comparison is like Wombat. They have, you know, Wombex and Magpie, which are their convex layers. So Enead is our convex layer. And we believe, you know, if you want like a fully, I guess, user-friendly model to extent. And when you have locking, especially with ours, we have four-year locks. Um, you want to have a system where people feel comfortable, you know, locking their, 
their money or their funds for X amount of time. And having this sort of a comics type layer where um, we take it an extra step further where you can actually turn that lock into a liquid uh, wrap token, which then can be used in their in any ad ecosystem. Um, um, and this is kind of inherited from, you know, back in the original Salty, there was Zero uh, X DAO um, and, uh, you know, uh, Solidex, which those are the two kind of pioneers when it came to, I guess, the solidly convex layers. And, you know, Enyad is, is built off of what was Monolith, which was built off of a combination of Solidex and, and Ox DAO. So essentially, I think, you know, you get the bo- best of both worlds where um, you, know, you, you can kind of keep this boosted system where users, they don't necessarily have to even, you know, outside, I guess you'd call it mercenary capital, if you will, they can, you know, stake and get kind of boosted rewards uh, without actually locking any tokens. Uh, and while you might be thinking, wait, you're just giving away like extra rewards to people who are mercenary. But the reality is the way the model works is, you know, there's a portion of the earned amount and performance fees and stuff that get actually locked um, and go towards users of the Ramses and, and uh, any ad ecosystem. So ultimately, even with this, this mercenary capital coming in, you're, they're still benefiting the model in a way. They're increasing the lock rate, increasing the, the fees given to people. Um, it's, it's like a net benefit, I believe. Um, and I, I think it's it's just very apparent. If you look at our lock rate, we have the highest lock rate out of any, you know, V3D model. Um, and it, it just shows that it just keeps going up and, and it's sustainable because it's just... You know, it's how it should be. I think when there's a lock-in model, the whole point is kind of scarcity and, and locking up as many tokens as possible so the underlying float is less and it makes it more valuable and harder to you know, acquire. And I think with you know this kind of a convex type layer, you're, you're, we have these these huge, uh, I guess, organizations kind of accumulating large positions. They are able to you know reduce the, the underlying circulating supply and float and make the you know, ability to actual hold locks and things like that more valuable. Uh, so I think ultimately, any ad is just a great net positive to the ecosystem. And we've seen other, you know, I guess you'd call them competitors or whatever. They see how successful any ad is and how great the model is. And they've even asked for them to come and try and build stuff for them. Uh, even though they don't have the boosted system, they just see the, the value in like the vote optimization and just kind of this this simplified user interface that's done through this convex type layer. So I think ultimately it's one of the, the better things that exists in the model. And, and I'm kind of sad that it's it's been kind of you know forgotten in these other similar type solidly models is they, they just got rid of boost. They didn't think it was necessary. But why why would it not be? You know, like you have to have some incentive for people like if people are just LPing and dumping your tokens, like you know, they're not really giving any benefit to your, your ecosystem. Whereas with this boost model, those who are actually willing to lock tokens and, and help the protocol, they will earn more rewards. So you provide this benefit to people who lock rather than promoting people who are LPing to give them higher rewards, which frankly is a negative feedback loop and doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think some people have opted to do that and I don't think they truly understand how the model works. Um, whereas, you know, we've been around since day one. We know exactly how the model works. We've seen it play out in so many different ways. Um, and this ultimately is, is how it should be. And I think it's very apparent in our lock rate. Yeah, you have WETH rewards just on the WETH side. I mean, the, you know, the AP, the t- total APR for holding, you know, a neat, uh, any ad re, you know, RAM position right now is close to, you know, up over 300%, but even the WEF rewards alone, you know, are 89, 90, they've been up over a hundred percent. Um, that's tough to beat. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, uh, Noc. So we are, we are coming up on the hour. We, I think we covered a lot. I don't know if anyone has any question. If not, we can wrap it up. Please, don't be shy. If anyone has questions or has request to speak. Yeah, I think this was a really good space. Um, thank you guys for coming on and uh, sharing 
your project and uh, your views on the uh, space. Yeah, thank you both, Doug and Oz, for coming and being yeah. with us. Thanks for thanks for having us anytime. I mean, it's always a it's always fun to chat with you and this and other venues. And so um, happy to jump on and talk about any topics. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be Ramsey's. Um, anything we can where we can be, um, you know, value add or um, you know, participate in. We'd love to do it with you. This is great. Thank you so much. Yeah, would, would be super happy to do a follow-up. That'd be great. Um, and um, to anyone who is watching on uh, YouTube or uh, on Twitter broadcasts or re-watching the space, uh, if you want to help out uh, our channel, uh, we just started doing this, so we really just started uh, putting attention to our Twitter account. Uh, please follow us on Twitter. That'd be great. Thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, all. Otherwise, we'll just close close it down. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.